Thank you, Brother Lewis. I want to tell you, I appreciate Brother Lewis. I've watched him over the last, I've been here, September will be two years, hard to believe. And um, I've watched as every Sunday he would go up to the pastor and put his hand on him and pray for him before he preached. This morning he came and put his hand on my shoulder and prayed for me. And uh, I appreciate him very much. Uh, There's nothing greater you can do for anybody than pray over them. So I appreciate him doing that. I don't like this microphone. It's taped down and it keeps coming undone. All right, we'll try that again. But it's, it's the only one that you can, you can hear well. First Kings chapter three. First Kings chapter three. We've been talking about lessons learned from the kings. Lessons learned from the kings. This morning we looked at seeking the Lord for wisdom. Seeking the Lord for wisdom. We're going to take a little detour from that tonight. I want to talk about something very specific. And next week we'll dive into it more when we look. And remember, I, I, I think I told all of you, I can't remember if I told first service, but there were five major things that happened when revival came to the nation of Israel. The first thing that happened was they sought the Lord. The second thing that happened was they removed their idols. The third thing to happen was they rebuilt the city walls. The next thing that happened was they retrained and rebuilt the army. And the last thing that happened was they rested in peace. The Bible says often that when those things happened that he gave them rest on every side. That's a blessing right there. He gave them rest on every side. Sometimes when you're in the battle, it seems like you you got this one hit. You're working on it. You got it it fighting the battle there, and you start getting attacked from behind. But the Bible says that when revival came, they had rest on every side. Something that we talked about just briefly this morning was in 1 Kings chapter 3 and in verse 2. And it said, the people, however were still sacrificing at the high places because a temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the statutes of his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. Now, if you will, turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 12. I want to explain to you for a few moments about the high places. Throughout the books of 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles, there are mentions, uh, and actually even goes back to Leviticus, uh, where they mentioned the high places. When the nation of Israel began to march to the promised land, they began to go through lands uh, that, that God gave them, they encountered that nation's gods, the gods that they worshiped and the places in which they worshiped. And God gave very specific instructions to the nation of Israel of how to handle those things. And I think this, it's good lessons that we can learn tonight. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, it says this, verse one, these are the decrees and laws you must be careful to follow in the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess as long as you live in the land. Destroy completely all the places on the high mountains and on the hills and under every spreading tree where the nations you are dispossessing worship their gods. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones and burn their Asherah poles in the fire. Cut down the idols of their gods and wipe out their names from those places. Now listen carefully. You must not worship the Lord your God in their way. Very important verse. You must not worship the Lord your God in their way. But you are to seek the place the Lord your God will choose from among all your tribes to put his name there for his dwelling. To that place you must go. There bring your burnt offerings and sacrifices, your tithes and special gifts, what you have vowed to give and your free will offerings and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. Look in verse 13. 
Be careful not to sacrifice your burnt offerings anywhere you please. Offer them only at the place the Lord will choose in one of your tribes and there observe everything I command you. Two things that we're gonna talk about tonight. First of all, we're gonna talk about a scriptural departure that took place at the high places, scriptural departure. And then we're gonna talk about spiritual experiences that took place at the high places. God gave specific commands. Two, in particular, verse four, you must not worship the Lord your God in their way. And then, verse 13, you be careful not to sacrifice your burnt offerings anywhere you please. You see in the first one, you must not worship the Lord your God in their way. We're gonna see spiritual experiences. And then the second one, be careful not to sacrifice your burnt offerings anywhere you please. We're going to see a, a, a departure, a scriptural departure. Because both of these things, the nation of Israel broke. They didn't keep the commands of the Lord. Now, a couple of things that happened. When they entered to the, to the lands that God was giving them, and they passed through those lands, getting to where God was taking them, they would come across these high places. These high places were places where uh, these nations set up. Now, sometimes it would be on top of a hill. Sometimes they would create a place. Sometimes it wouldn't be high at all. It was just considered the high place. But most of the time, they would find a natural hill where they would place their, their altars, their structures, where they would offer sacrifices to the gods that they served. Activities that happened at the high places were things like uh, animal sacrifices, human sacrifices, prostitution. They would make their, their daughters walk through fire as part of their religious practices. There's many times in scripture where they would take their children and, and offer them to the God that they served and, and burn them up. Detestable practices, demonic practices. And God said to them, when you go through these nations, you tear it down, you smash them, you uh, obliterate the names of their God from history. Do away with them, they're not gods. You do away with them. But what we've seen is they didn't do that. We get the glimpse of that it says the people, however, were still sacrificing in the high places. Well, you see, well, Brother Sam, they didn't have a place to worship. Well, they hadn't had one yet except for the tabernacle, the, the tent. And that's what, that's what God gave them to worship in. And God was very careful to say to them, you don't sacrifice to your God anywhere you please. Church is not about you. It's not about me. But we are living today in a consumer mentality inside the church house. People walk into our doors, what are you going to give me? What are you going to do for me? How, how do I feel about this? We have created among ourselves a whole new cult inside the Christian church that's based on us, not based on God's word, not based on what God has taught us, but based on us. We're consumers, I want it my way. And if you don't give it to me my way, there's another church down the road, they'll give it to me my way. I'll have it the way I want it. The Lord said, you don't get the option to sacrifice to God or to worship God the way you please. In the New Testament, he teaches us those who are going to worship the Lord, worship him in spirit and in truth. Which means we set aside, when, I, when we walk in the door, we should be setting aside what we want. I, I thought that Brother Lance said it very well this morning. If the only reason you come is to get something, you've missed it. 
The reason we come together is because we're the family of God. We're the body of Christ, and we've come to have something in common, and that is our relationship with Jesus Christ. You and I have that in common. If you know the Lord, we have in common the fact that we're not perfect. We're forgiven. We've been washed by the blood of the lamb and we come together to say together to our God, Lord, we love you, we worship you. We give you our praise and our honor and our adoration. We don't come to worship him just any way we please. Paul said, we make it our goal to please him. So spiritual experiences, we're living in a day where people want all kinds of spiritual experiences. They want new highs, new, uh, it may not be in the Bible, but they want something to keep stirring them, to keep making them feel a certain way. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Some mornings I get up, I don't feel saved. Now, don't look at me like a bunch of pious windbags. You don't either. There's some mornings I get up that I'm thinking, do I even know God? But you know what's not about how I feel? Because it's in those moments I go back and say, God has never changed. His word is the same. He is true forever and forever. We don't get the option to worship as we please. Worship is about him. One of the issues that I have faced as a worship leader for many years was the trend of going contemporary versus traditional versus blended hymns, choruses, different styles of worship. I love what we do. I love the blended where we mix some of the new, some of the old. I like that because uh, I, I... I'm not against those churches who have a contemporary service and who have a true die. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm, I'm going to give you my uh, gospel according to me. All right? When you, in my opinion, when you start separating contemporary and traditional, I mean, I even had one guy tell me, you know, we could have a bluegrass service. We could have a cowboy service. We got, I, you know, you can divide this up any which way you want it. Oh, my goodness. But what happens is you start coming to church based on what you want and your preferences, your likes, and your dislikes. When the ultimate purpose of coming into the house of God is to give him praise and give him worship and honor him and please him. He, he told them, don't sacrifice any which way you please. He laid out in his word how they were to worship. And in the New Testament, he's laid it out for us again. We worship in spirit and in truth. I, I want to quickly read you something. I shared this the other night briefly, but I'm just going to hit it one more lick because I'm there. In Romans chapter 14, In verse 9, I'm sorry, verse, chapter 12 in verse 9, he says, love must be sincere. If it's not sincere, it's not love. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Now look at this, honor one another above yourself. Can you imagine if we got a church house full of people honoring the next person above themselves? That means I prefer your way over mine. Can you imagine what would happen if we all, all of us did that? I prefer what you want more. I'm going to take a back seat and I'm going to let you do what, what you want. I'm going to serve you. I don't want you serving me. I'm going to serve you. Now, if we're all doing that, we're having a competition almost of who can outserve the other person. Can, can you imagine? Love must be sincere. And back in Deuteronomy chapter 12, 
He said, you must not worship the Lord your God in their way. As they moved through the nations, they were to destroy all the high places. Matter of fact, he said there, you're to seek the place of the, of the Lord your God. Sorry, let me find that spot. Uh, verse three, he said, you're to break down their altars. You are to smash their sacred stones and burn their Asherah poles. Cut down the idols of their gods and wipe out their names from those places. But they didn't do it. What they did was, instead of destroying those places, they incorporated their worship into their, uh, the nation's worship. They incorporated the worship of Jehovah God into the nations who worshiped idols, demonic worship. They began to bring Jehovah God's worship into the same altar, the same places as these detestable, that's what the Bible calls them, detestable gods, because they're not really gods. They're blending demonic worship, worldly worship, with true spiritual Jehovah God worship. Now we can shake our heads and we can get angry and we can say, how dare they? But we do it. We bring worldly means, fleshly thoughts and fleshly ways into our worship service and then ask God to bless it. And he said, destroy it. Tear down their altar, smash the stones, cut it, cut their idols down. But we do the same. Solomon, back in 1 Kings, was no better. Solomon is probably the greatest example of it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Solomon started out so great. He asked God to give him wisdom that only God can impart. And you see chapter after chapter of, of how the Lord gave him that wisdom. He would make rulings and, and, and judgments that, was, that were beyond human wisdom. But Solomon had a problem. I want to show you real quick that the one thing that, that Solomon did was he built the temple of the Lord. And at the end of that time, in chapter 9, the Lord appears to Solomon a second time. Now, here is a king that God has appeared to him now a second time. And he says to him in chapter 9 of 1 Kings, he says, the Lord responds to him and says, I have heard the prayer and plea you have made before me. I have consecrated this temple which you have built. And look at this, by putting my name there forever. Forever. That's the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 12, where he said that there, was come, come, there would come a time that God would put his name there and dwell there. This is his fulfillment. But look at what happened to Solomon. Let me find that. Chapter 11. I mentioned to you this morning that Solomon, first, one of the first things he did was he married the daughter of the Egyptian king. He didn't stop there. You see, Solomon had a weakness, a big one. <laughs> Chapter 11, it says, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth, and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. Now, if I had time, I'd make some comment there, but I won't. But I will say this. 
Who you're married to is important. And that's for men and women. Who you're married to is important. Because these women were his downfall. But the ultimate problem goes back to obedience. They did not destroy what God told them to destroy. They did not do what God said for them to do. If they had done what God had said and tore down the altars of the false gods, and even Solomon, when he became king, if he had done what his father told him to do, and been devoted and followed God's commands and decrees wholeheartedly, he wouldn't have found himself in this mess. Verse 4 says, as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord, his God, as the heart of David, his father, had been. You see, David had a high place in his life. The high places where he went to worship and intermingled the worship of Jehovah God with detestable demonic gods was representative of a high place in his own life that he had not surrendered wholly, was not fully devoted to the Lord his God. He followed the ways of the Lord, but he had this one little area, and it kept growing and growing and growing to the point where he found himself with 1,000 women pulling at his heart, tugging at his heart, moving him away from the Lord his God. And the Bible says it teaches that he, he held fast to them, in love. My, ch- my question to tonight, church, is what are you holding on to? Where's your high place? What is the one little thing in your life that God has been trying to get his hand on and telling you, be obedient, do what I've told you to do? Get rid of the high places, smash the idols. Where's your high place? What is it God's been dealing with you about that you don't want to let go? I can tell you from experience in the word of God, it will drive you away from the Lord. There will come a point in your life, you're going to have to decide, do I want this thing or do I want God? Because you can't have them both. Solomon made his choice. He finished terrible. He started well. He finished unfaithful. He was unfaithful to God's word. He was unfaithful to God's decrees. And he wound up in the end being totally uncommitted and unfaithful to God himself. Where's your high places? Is your heart fully devoted to God? Or have you got places in your life that that may seem small right now? Because earlier in the chapter, earlier in the book, it said that, that Solomon loved God, except he sacrificed at the high places. It didn't seem very big at the time. It didn't seem like a big deal at the time. But it became one. Matter of fact, look how far it went. In verse 6, so Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. Verse 7, on a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Shemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same, look at this, for all his foreign wives, 700 altars to foreign gods because of his wives. He he burned incense and offered sacrifice to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord. Now, real quickly, before we go tonight, I want to show you. You see what happens when a person starts well but doesn't finish well. I want you to see what happens when a man does do what God has told him to do. Turn over to 2 Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 14. Verse 
The Bible says in chapter 14 and verse 2, Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He removed the foreign altars in the high places. He smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. He did exactly what God told him to do. He was obedient to the word of the Lord, and he followed God wholeheartedly. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, and to obey his laws and commands. He removed the high places and incense altars in every town in Judah, and the kingdom was at peace under him. I'm going to tell you something. When you do what God says do, God gives you peace. When you obey him, you will succeed. I want you to see chapter 15, the last thing. We talked about this some the other night in, in prayer meeting, and I just want to end tonight with this challenge to you. Chapter 15, verse 1 says, The Spirit of God came upon Azariah, son of Oded. He went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. I touched on that just for a minute this morning. But we got that confused in our churches today. We think when we're doing something for God, then God is with us. No, no, no. He said very clearly, the Lord is with you when you are with him. It's not up to God to make sure you're with him. It's up to you to make sure you're with God. The Lord's with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. We're talking about promises from the Lord. If you seek him, he will be found. Now, this is probably one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Verse 12 of chapter 15. They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord. All of the nation of Judah entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, with all their heart and soul. All who would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, were put to death. I told him Wednesday night, I don't know if we could really add that to our bylaws or not, but <laughs> might be a little much. <laughs> but they were serious. That's how serious this nation was at the time of seeking God. They made a covenant, and if you wasn't going to abide by the covenant and seek the Lord, you have to be put to death. But I'm going to tell you something, church. We can seek him or we can forsake him. But if you don't seek him, we die. We die. Our only hope tonight is to seek the Lord our God. Our only hope tonight is to turn to him and say, Lord, we put away our high places. We smash the stones. We do away with everything that is detestable in your sight and be wholly committed to follow after you, no matter the cost, no matter what it means, no matter how much of myself I have to die to, which is going to be all. I'll do whatever you say. Seek him and he will be found by you. Forsake him, he will forsake you. And you can choose to seek him or we can die. Folks, we can come up with a whole lot of other options, but it boils down to this. You can either do what God said or we'll never be what God created us to be. I've been in some dead Baptist churches, folks. It's not worth it. It's not worth it to hold on to your high place because you don't want to just give up of yourself. It's not worth it to hold on to that little idol in your life. If you'll seek him and you throw away your idols. And remember, this is the house of the living God. We have to do it God's way or he will not bless it. We cannot bring things into here and say, okay, God, here's the way we want to do it. Now come and bless it. It doesn't work that way. The Lord is with you when you are with him. Tonight, let's seek him. Let's come back to the Lord and say, Lord, we need you. We don't need stuff. We don't need things. We don't need anything else. We need you. We seek after you. And whatever it takes, folks, if we could... Uh, Take on that policy in our life, that motto in our life, 
whatever it takes, God. Whatever it takes, whatever I have to do to know you, whatever I have to do to come in contact with the Holy God and know him like I've never known him before, I'll do it. Whatever thing I've got to throw down, whatever I've got to leave behind, I'll do it. My mom used to sing a song, still does, whatever it takes for my will to break, that's what I'm willing to do. He could take, the song says, he, you can take houses or lands. Just goes on to say that whatever you have to do in my life to bring me to the point that I'm all yours, that's what I'm willing to do. What are we gonna do, church? You wanna hold on to your high place tonight because you're unwilling to die to yourself? Are we willing to turn it loose and say, Lord, I'll give up whatever I'll lay myself down. But John said in John 3.30, he must increase, I must decrease. If we're gonna know him, if we're gonna see him do what I believe God wants to do in this place, then we must seek him. He will be found. It's a promise. To know in our hearts that he's with us when we are with him. He, he's not the, it was an old song years ago that said that the Lord is my co-pilot. If he is, you better change seats. He's, he's guiding the ship or he's not doing it at all. The Lord is with us when we're with him. Tonight, church, let's seek him. Let's determine in our hearts whatever it takes for God to move. Whatever I have to do. We can't look around the room. We gotta look in us. Whatever I have to do, whatever it takes to make me like Jesus, that's what I'm willing to do. Let's stand together with every head bowed and every eye closed.